everyone, how are we all this morning? Another Sunday in November, gee, we're more than halfway through. Time is moving along. I feel like I keep saying that because it's true, time keeps moving along. Um, you may have noticed this particular month uh, of November in the shirts I've been wearing, they've been, they've been of a certain color. Um, you can guess what's been happening. Yes, State of Origin's been on. Um, so um, I've just been in theme, just been in Maroons um, as I support the Maroons. But anyway, I um, get distracted by that. Let's carry on. That was just a short note for anyone who may have noticed um, the colour of my shirt and, um, uh, and that's um, potentially connected with you. Anyway, let's carry on. I have had the privilege this month of um, being able to share with you guys um, on behalf of Taya and I, Pastors Taya and I of Life Impact Church. And for those of you who might be connecting in for the first time, I am uh, Pastor Brett and my darling wife is Pastor Taya. And um, I encourage you just to, if this is your first time listening, that you would just backtrack a few Sundays, uh, at least the Sundays of November and really um, listen to all the YouTube messages so that this kind of falls in in, in sync with, um, with what we've been teaching and preaching about. And I guess um, the main theme and main drive of this month, normally we have monthly themes. Um, we haven't kind of really uh, named a theme for this month because it is about going into the new. It is about, um, you know, teaching and, and communicating about uh, meeting in multiple locations uh, in the new year. Uh, as Life Impact Church, we're not going to be meeting um, in our auditorium as one large gathering. We're going to be meeting across our region, across our town in multiple locations. So really just wanting to found that, wanting to encourage us in that. And I want to continue on today, uh, picking up from where I was teaching last week around um, what I believe the Lord revealed to me in terms of what the new wine is, what this new season is, and one of the key factors of what the Holy Spirit is doing fresh and new. And if we can um, apply this, if we can... So th this is the new wine. This is what God's doing. And as we give um, the, new, the new wine the place to be stored, to be held, to be carried, which is what the wine scheme was for... Um, you know, um, next week I'm going to talk about the wine skin. We're going to study that out a bit, what new wine and wine skin is. But today I want to want to carry on with what I believe the new wine is, and that is relinquishing control. Uh, this is critical for our life. It's critical for our discipleship. It's critical in following Jesus. And we're going to look at a couple of scriptures. We're going to spend most of our time this morning in Acts nine, which is the uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, where he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And we're just going to break that down a little bit and look at how relinquishing control was critical and pivotal to Paul moving in um, the call of God and the purpose of God for his life. And that was to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Unless he relinquished control, that would never have happened. And so Moving into a new season for us and, and talking about new wine, and I believe a new wine, as I've said, is relinquishing control, that we must partake of this. We must relinquish control um, to actually be able to move forward in the freshness of what the Holy Spirit is doing. And you might listen to this um, and conclude at the end that it's nothing new. You might have already concluded that. And I agree with you um, that it's not anything new. It's scripturally based. It's founded right back as we're going to look at Acts 9. Um, that it's critical that we live this way. But for the Lord to do what he's going to do in this new season, I know the Holy Spirit is saying, come on, people, come on, people, relinquish control. Um, you know that um, the last nine months with COVID-19 has been a testing time for, 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 for the people of the world, for the human race. As governments and leaders of, and people in authority have made decisions on behalf of communities and nations, uh, to control movements and to control expressions and to control meetings to try and control uh, the spread of this disease, COVID-19. So control is, um, I think it's pivotal and it's critical at the moment in, the, in history that we're born for a time such as this. And the church, it's time, you know, in this season, um, as we've linked into a prophetic word spoken recently, and we've been talking about that, that as the world falls into greater darkness, the church... We are the light of the world. We are the Jesus is the light of the world and we shine his light. 
And what good would it be if we were the light and we were under a lampshade or under a bushel? So we have to manage this. We have to break through in the area of control um, for us to move as the church in the, this space in history and impact our communities with the light and life and love of Jesus Christ. So this is critical. So I really want to spend some time over the next couple of weeks and, and even leading into Christmas, really just focusing on what the Lord is saying here about control. So relinquishing control, relinquishing, as we talked last week, is to, is the vol- is to voluntarily cease to keep or claim control. It's to give up control. So if we're going to relinquish control, it's a voluntarily, it's a voluntary move. So it's not enforced. Um, it's voluntary. Uh, if it's enforced, um, then you haven't actually relinquished it. You've, you've, you've been forced to, you've been made to. So relinquishing doesn't fit, right? So relinquishing control is critical that we focus on this relinquishing aspect just for a moment, that it's a voluntary decision that I cease to claim and keep control of people in my life and of the circumstances um, and events of my life. Um, now, that word control is the power that we exercise, the power to influence or direct people's behavior or a course of events. So think for a minute, you all have, or we all have had an experience with someone in our life that mean we may have left a meeting with them or, um, or we might leave their space and we may have thought they were controlling. Um, you know, that's a controlling person. And you would identify certain behaviors and you would identify certain things to actually assume that about someone or to declare that about someone. Um, so control, you would say that because someone's tried to modify or change your behavior or they've tried to, you know, control a course of events or circumstances uh, in their life or your life. And therefore they are, they're asserting their influence of power to um, out to, to bring about an outcome or a behavior in someone's life. And this is exactly what I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to us about. We have to relinquish control. We can't be controlling people. We can't be controlling people's behaviors um, and we can't be uh, trying to control circumstances um, because we to follow Jesus, we have to trust and believe that he is the controller of all things, that he is the Lord of all things. And so if there's any area of our life that we haven't relinquished control, it will cause us to behave in certain manners. And these are the manners that I believe the Holy Spirit wants to identify and wants to address um, in this period of time in our life so that when we move into the new year and we and, and, and we, we connect into how we're going to gather differently and the teaching and the equipping and that whole space, what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our heart and our life has to be set um for what he, for his plan. So in this season, relinquishing control requires a mind that carries the possibility, the ability for the possibility for something else to happen. So let's just work this through. New wine, I believe, the Lord has shown, uh, shown me, is relinquishing control. The Holy Spirit is moving with a fresh flow of his desire and power in our hearts and minds to engage us in his desire and plan for us to relinquishing control over people and events and circumstances in our life. So we're speaking to teachers and bosses and, uh, and, and employees and employers. We're speaking to parents. We're speaking to the Holy Spirit is speaking to husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and neighbors that, that as we follow Jesus, to follow Jesus, we must relinquish control. We must relinquish control to follow him. All our Christian commitments, processes, patterns, passions, etc., are only fruitful when we have relinquished control. So all the things we do as a Christian, all the places we go, all the things we hold dear to, um, all the attributes and characteristics of someone who follows Jesus, a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, the way we conduct ourselves in prayer and the, and the reading of the word, our businesses, our finances, our, our, our language, our, um, our, our behaviors, our attitudes, um, our, our meetings, our, the things we value, those, those, those rituals or those rites, you know, those things that we do, taking of communion, um, meeting together, which, you know, is, is critical. It's a pattern. It's a form. It's something we do. All those areas of our life are only fruitful if we've relinquished control. 
without relinquishing control of our life and the people in it to the Lord, we only kick against the goads. We only kick against God's ways. We're only kicking against him. And we're going to look at Acts 9 shortly and we're going to break that down a little bit. So what control does, control binds the mind. Let's turn to uh, Romans 12 uh, and, and verse 1 and 2 and have a quick look at Romans 12 verse 1 and 2. And here we see Paul beseeching, encouraging the church to surrender, to release, to relinquish control. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And in verse two, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. You know, control binds the mind. If we have a, an issue, if we have a control issue in our life, then what that does, it, it sets our mind in certain spaces. It sets our mind in certain places. We aren't open to the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God working through all the areas of our life because of a mindset. Romans 8, 5, you know, talks about um, mindsets and, you know, where your mind, where is your mindset? There you will find your mindsets. So where is your mind set? There you will find your mindsets. Let's just have a look at Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. So where is your mind set? There you will find your mindsets. So if we set our mind on the things of the flesh, we will live according to those mindsets, according to the flesh. So at this time in our life, we the, the, the Spirit of God in terms of our season and what he's saying to us about relinquishing control is that we must live according to the Spirit and therefore our minds are set on the things of the Spirit. So to change a mindset, we have to give ourselves to the possibility of something different or something else, something outside of our control, outside of our influence, outside of our power actually happening. And, and this is important because if we can't accept that, then we can't be moved by the Holy Spirit to go to certain people, to certain places and do certain things because of a mindset. We're going to see that God addressed the mindset of Saul of Tarsus and he also addressed the mindset of Ananias uh, in Acts 9. So how do we follow Jesus without relinquishing control? I don't believe we can because if we don't relinquish control, all we will follow is our mindsets. All we will follow is where we have set our mind. And to every believer, every follower of Jesus, it is a daily decision. It is a constant um, presentation to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, to give ourselves to the transforming of our mind. And the only way we can do that is if we give ourselves to another possibility, something that we think outside of what we think will happen could happen. Right? So, if we can't do that, we'll be set in our minds and we will follow those mindsets and we won't find um, the, the fruitfulness in our life that I believe the Spirit of God is looking for, is desiring in our lives, right? So to be renewed in mind is to accept the new. We first accept the new by accepting Jesus, right? So to be renewed right now, to be renewed in our mind, we have to accept the new. What is the new? Well, for us as a church, as we speak about regathering in the new year and all the things that the Lord wants to do in that space, we first have to accept it's new. We have to accept the new. And the only way we can accept the new is by accepting Jesus, right? Because if we don't have Jesus, we only have our mindsets. We can only follow those things that are impressed upon us, those things that we think. So in moving forward as a church and being fruitful in this new season, we must change our mindsets. We have to say to Jesus, which is what Paul's saying here in Romans. Let's read it again. Romans 12. 
Romans 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed, no longer follow. Okay, conform means to fashion alike or to follow the same pattern. Do not be conformed. So right now for us, do not be conformed to the way things were. Um, we have to give ourselves to the way things will be, even though we don't know exactly what that's going to look like. So there's always the element of risk in presenting yourself to a mindset shift because that's, that's, that's it. Our mindsets are what we can control. They're connected to control in our life. And remember that control binds the mind. It wraps it up, it ties it up, it keeps it locked in one way of thinking or a certain way of thinking that the Spirit of God, the Lord God, wants to shift um, for us to grow and to move forward productively in this new season. So do not be conformed to the world. Do not be conformed. Don't fashion alike. Don't follow the old pattern, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the transformation is connected to being renewed, that we might prove, that there might be proof of the goodness and the acceptable power, the, the awesome will that God has, the perfect will of God for us as a church, for our life. So mindsets, mindset shift, sorry, minds, mindsets, blah, blah, mindsets shift by accepting other possibilities. Control is a mindset that blocks out other possibilities and affects all of our life, right? So when we, we can't let go of control, it becomes a mindset and it sets us to block out the possibilities, other possibilities of happening. And, and we, we, we get so tied up and so bound up by that control that uh, it, it affects our whole life, right? The moment you accept the possibility something else might happen that you don't like or that you don't accept or that it is new that you, or that you don't want to happen, you actually are relinquishing control. So the moment you say to the Lord, okay, Lord, it's going to be different. It's going to look different. Uh, my life is now going to. My life should be different completely, but this whole regathering and doing it in multiple locations is going to be different to what I'm used to. If we don't give ourselves to the possibility that some of the things we might fear might happen, then we don't even open ourselves up to the possibility that there might be fruit there. So that stops us and it binds us from actually experiencing the renewing. Uh, or the new, the perfect will of God happening in our life. So relinquishing control requires us to give, to, to change a mindset, to actually present ourselves to the possibility that something else might happen. It might be the case that our growth over the last 20 years or whatever your church experience has been like has been great and been amazing and you're thinking, well, this is how I grow. If we don't give ourselves to the possibility that there's other dimensions of growth, there's other possibilities of growth, there's other fruit of growth that are going to happen as we meet in multiple locations, then potentially we will only grow at that rate when there's another rate that God might have for us to grow in. So it's important. Relinquishing control is the new one. We have to relinquish control. The other thing that relinquishing control does, it allows us to be under control. So if we can be a person or be a saint, a follower of Jesus Christ that relinquishes control to him, that relinquishes control to him, that gives it all to Jesus, we will find that we will fit under control. We will be able to be governed or controlled um, differently. We won't kick against authorities. We won't complain against them we, because we can accept that this authority is in place because God's in control. And the word lines up with that, that he's given us as ministers, the governing authorities of our life. And as we abide by those authorities in our life, those governances, those governors, those leaders, those masters, whatever they are, our employers, you know, those people in authority in our life, they are our ministers. So the spirit of God is ministering to us through those authorities. So if we don't relinquish control, we cut off the flow of the ministry of God through the authorities in our life. And that's how God ministers to us. It's an aspect of his ministry. This is powerful. We really, I really encourage us to give our hearts to this, give our minds to this uh, so that God can do his work. The risk is that you think it's not going to work or that you think it's wrong. And so my goal is to, is to really give the word clearly, to preach the word clearly so that you can freely say to Jesus, I'm giving myself to you, Jesus. 
I'm not giving myself to the instruction of Pastor Brett or Pastor Taya. I'm giving myself to you, Jesus. And therefore, you can minister to me through those that you've given in my life, those authority figures in my life. And you can see the Spirit of God guide, protect and deliver us into a whole new realm of kingdom authority and the Spirit of God outworking itself in our life. Um, that's why I'm just I'm so excited about this new season. Jesus controls through access to provisions and invitation to follow. So when we give our life to Jesus, we give control over to him. We're giving the control to him, which which enables us. So he's not bossing us around. He's not, you know, he's not, you think, so he's not exercising his power and his influence over you to change your behavior or to change the course of events that you're doing in your life. He's not controlling in that sense. What he's doing is he's presenting us to a whole new world, a whole new kingdom, a whole new kingdom of, of, of dominion. So coming under the control of Jesus, he's, he's sharp, he's specific. There's only one way. There's no, there's no getting around it. It's, it's not an option. It, it's, it's set. It's specific. There's one way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So he's Lord, right? So let's not miss that. He's Lord, but he's not lording it over. He's not exercising authority over you he's giving you access to his provisions and invitation to follow him which which enables us to walk in that space right so if you think about what jesus controls what he has overcome you and i have the choice to follow him or not right so he exercises his command his authority his control over the things that affect us whilst not controlling us so sickness, disease, and all the things that Jesus has given has authority over, all demonic activity, um, all the things that are happening, we, are, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So he's overcome everything, but he is not exercising his power and his dominion over your will, over your decision. It's a, it, his control is he is my provision, his access to everything that I have. I want you to know who I am so that you can freely, voluntarily relinquish uh, the claim you have over your life so that you can let my claim over your life come to pass in your life through all the provisions of the kingdom of heaven, of my attributes and and, and, and who I am, says God, right? So, and, and it's invitation to follow, which is what I've been talking about the last couple of weeks with what Jesus said to the two disciples that asked to be on the left and the right, right? Jesus saying, that's not, this is not a conquest. This is not, that's not how the kingdom of God operates. I'm coming in as a minister to shoulder your burdens and you can willingly follow me. And we see that with, with um, Bartimaeus's response. Jesus didn't say, you have to now get on your knees and serve me. He said, I've come to serve you, Bartimaeus, and I'm going to express it and instigate it and show you and teach you and, and, and get you experience it by, I've overcome the blindness in your life. Bartimaeus knew what that meant. He knew he tried everything. He knew he had no control and no power over his sight. He knew that there was a master, a controller, that there was a big boss that he just that he knew was the son of David, that he knew was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and he willingly followed. So Jesus is going, I'm not making people do anything. I'm, I'm bringing the provision of the kingdom and I'm inviting people into that space and that's where my control is. That's where my dominion is. So this is critical that we get this, that we must relinquish control because how we treat others is tied to this. If we can't trust God, then we are actually living, we have a control issue and therefore we're, we're actually trying to influence and, and override and and, uh, and overcome the people and the behaviors in our life. And, and Jesus is saying, not so among you. That's not how you're going to behave. That's not how I behave. It's invitation. Um, you know, the kingdom is here and it has its dominion. And make no mistake about it, it is the way that it is. And Jesus is Lord and we're not manipulating or changing anything. But he's not manipulating us. He's going, here it is. I've come and I've defeated the power of sin. And now God has his expression again on earth through mankind. There's, there's been a peace made. There's been oneness made with God. So God and his kingdom is back on earth in free, free reign through his believers. That's the kingdom. Now follow me. Follow me. Right, let's go to Acts 9. It's powerful. Acts 9. I'm going to go back to Acts 9. I've got a bookmark somewhere else. I'm not going there. Acts 9, because I want to tie this up. Acts 9, verse 1. 
Then Saul, still breathing threats, murder against and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Look at control. Those two verses are full of what Paul wants. He is trying to exercise his power and his influence over people's behaviors. He is not happy that people are following Jesus in the way. So he is exercising his authority and his power. He's breathing threats and murder against them. He wants them to stop it or he's going to stop it for them. He's going to bind them and gather them. This is, this is absolute control right here. Right. As he journeyed along the road in verse three near Damascus, suddenly a light, light shone around him from heaven and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I believe that when we try to exercise our influence and our power and our control over people, we're persecuting Jesus. We're persecuting his demands, his dominion and his control of all of us of his provision, right? Last month we talked about provision. That's no mistake that the Holy Spirit is wanting, you know, to found us in, in his provision, that he is provider so that we can understand. And remember, he's setting up new wineskin. He's preparing new wineskin so that relinquishing control isn't spilled, isn't wasted, but it's actually fulfilled. And we move and we come out of this season and into the next season. or We operate in this season with a whole new mindset around control. Right, So Paul, Saul of Tarsus, he's on a mission to control people. He's not happy with their behavior. And so he's going to, to, to manage and control events in their life um, by the exertion of his power and his influence based on his mindsets and what he thinks they should be doing. Jesus interrupts this and said, you're persecuting me. Right, You're working against me. You're kicking against me. And he says, who are you, Lord? That word, Lord, is simply this. In that moment, Saul of Tarsus recognized the Supreme One had met him. It is him saying supremacy. You are the supreme one. Supreme in authority. Oh, you are supreme in authority. I have, I, I've got authority and I'm trying to wield it. I've got power and I'm trying to exercise it over people. I'm, I'm, I'm in control here of people's lives. And I've gone to the, the, uh, the religious leaders uh, in Jerusalem to exercise it, to have my authority boosted and bolstered uh, so that I can exercise it. So don't miss this. Saul of Tarsus is going, the Supreme One has just arrived in my space and I'm on my face. The Supreme One has just arrived in my space and I'm on my face. He fell to the ground as the light shone around him. So when he said, "You, who are you, Lord? He was declaring, you're the Supreme One. You are supreme in authority. You are my new controller. He was. That's what this word means. Lord, it means controller as that of an honoring and respectful title. So when he said Lord, he was there was honor and there was respect. He would recognized right now that there was a pivotal moment in his life. And he was saying, you are Lord and you are master, sir, you're God. You are the supreme one. And Jesus then spoke and said, I am Jesus. Ah. Connecting who the supreme one is. I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, Supreme One, what do you want me to do? Here in this statement, we can see a relinquishing of control. He didn't just make Jesus Lord of his life and then follow according to his own power and his own influence. He actually ceased to keep claim of control of his life because we know that because from this moment, he walks a different life. We know that he goes to Damascus and he does not exercise his authority over people's behavior. He, can, he treats people totally differently. So we know that he didn't arrest anybody because they were in the way. He supported that claim. He encouraged them because he had accepted. He had a Lord. He was supreme. He was the supreme in authority. And now he was in control of his life. So when Paul says, I beseech you, when he says, come on, you can't be conformed. You've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He, he understands that in this moment, there had to be, he had to give himself to the possibility that someone else now is in control and give himself to the possibility that other people are going to behave the way they're going to behave. And he shouldn't control that. So Paul engaged the Lord as Lord in a very deliberate and specific way. He changed his attitude towards controlling his life to following Jesus' commands. Ananias did something very specific and very powerful here as well. Let's just pick up what Ananias did. So, so he's trembling. Um, let, actually, let's just go in verse 6. Look at what Jesus says. The Lord said to him, Arise and go 
into the city and you will be told what you must do. That is, that is an invitation. The Supreme One speaking, it's an invitation to follow, but it is strong. Look at the wording here, arise and go. There's no other option, into the city. What city? Not any city, but the city of Damascus, where you're heading. Go into the city and you will be told what you must do. In the city is where you'll be told, not a tree on the outskirts, not a river on the outskirts, but right where. So it is very important that we see this, that there was a deliberate and specific change in Paul's movements. He went to the city not to arrest and control people. He relinquished control and he went to the city to be told what he must do to be told what he must do. So Jesus Christ is Lord and and we honour and we respect him. Um, Like I said last week or the week before, I haven't made him Lord. I've positioned the Lord in my life. Like, so he's Lord, whether I believe it or not. So anyone who doesn't believe Jesus Christ is Lord doesn't mean Jesus isn't Lord. It means they haven't accepted it. They haven't prescribed him. They haven't positioned him. They haven't served him. They haven't respected and honored that he is the supreme one, right? So when we become believers and we say this in his prayer or whatever, whatever you did, um, you didn't miraculously make Jesus Lord. You were making a declaration that that you would show by the following days and weeks and years of your life that you were deliberately now going to specifically follow his commands because you recognized he was Lord. And that's why this isn't new. Relinquishing control isn't new. But it's a season that the Holy Spirit is saying, come on now, we have to relinquish control. Come on now, we have to relinquish control. So Saul goes, he journeyed and went exactly to Damascus where he was told to go. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias in verse 10. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and Ananias says, here I am, Lord, here I am, controller, here I am, supreme one, here I am, supreme in authority. And the Lord said to him, arise and go, very direct, very straight. You've got to go to the street called straight, nowhere else, not Gibson's Road, not Horse and Jockey Road, not Lansdowne Road, but you have to go exactly where I tell you, right? So he's in command. He's the commander and the chief. He's the controller, but it's an invitation. My provision's going to be there, right? In If, if you follow me, if you follow my commands, if you relinquish the control of your life and what you want to do and what you think might happen and you let me, I will provide. My provision will be there, right? And inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Think about this. Inquire, Ananias is right there. Yep, Jesus is talking. You're the you're supreme. You're in authority. <laughs> Woo-hoo! Yes, Lord, here I am. Speak to me. And out of the Lord's, in the vision, out of the Lord's mouth comes the words, Saul of Tarsus. Ananias is immediately going, I'm a dead man. No way. Right? If, if he had a control issue, it's risen right now. Right? It's right present. It's there because though Saul of Tarsus meant arrest, prison, back to Jerusalem, dead meat. It meant, um, it meant persecution. It meant breathing threats of death right, and murder. Um, and that was happening. Right? So for behold, he is praying. The, things don't make sense right now. Lord, are you, do you understand this? Right? And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias. He's seen you. I've shown him you, Ananias. Get this. This is awesome, right? So Saul of Tarsus, is, he's in the street called Straight. He's at Judas's house, <clears throat> and he's praying to me as Lord, Ananias. And I've shown him you, Ananias. I've set this up. This is so good. The Lord's going, I've got it all sorted, right? i got it all sorted. And, and he's seen you coming in and putting his hands, your hands on him. Right? And, and, and and seen him that he might receive his sight. So he's trusting you to move. He, I've shown him, I'm trusting you to move, right? I've set all this up now, Ananias, what are you going to do? Are you going to fulfill the vision? Are you going to fulfill, remember what Paul said, you know, that with the perfect will of God might be uh, accepted, might be seen in our life. Um, here's God de- declaring right here the perfect will, but it's reliant on two men following him. It's relying on Paul being in Judas's house because he was told to rise and go to that place and you'll be told what you must do. It, and, and it's connected to Ananias going, yes, sir, yes, God, yes, boss, I'm going there and relinquishing control. Then Ananias answered, Lord, boss, supreme one, oh, my master, I have heard from many about this man, right? How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Hello, Master, I'm one of your saints and, and, and I might not be in Jerusalem, but I'm in Damascus and this guy wants to take me to Jerusalem and do me harm. And, he, and, I, and here he has authority. So here in Damascus, I know he's got authority. There's letters circulating that he has authority from the chief priests to bind all, to bind me 
You're wanting to send me to him and all who call on your name. Well, I'm a caller on your name. Jesus, do you have any idea what's happening here? But the Lord said to him, go, go, right? Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. Right there, Ananias relinquished control. You saw it. I saw it. It's written here. In, excuse me. It's written here in the scripture. Oh, no. So what Ananias had to do was to give himself to the possibility that rather than arrest, there would be miracles. There would be blind eyes opened. And the moment he did that, he relinquished control. And he let the controller, he let God move him into a space where there was no, he was out of control. He had no control. Where Ananias had no control. So I'm going to just close this morning. I've gone on long enough. Control binds the mind. And to be renewed in the mind, we have to give ourselves to the possibility that Jesus Christ is in command of all things and that he's good and that he cares for you and that he's, he's very specific and very direct and he's inviting us to follow him, right? So Jesus' control, his supreme authority is, is through the access. He operates it through the access of his provisions and it's by invitation. So this morning, relinquishing control, relinquishing control, relinquishing control. We're going to talk a bit more about it. I'm going to carry on again next week. Let me just pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for speaking to us. I thank you, Father God, that that you are speaking to us, Holy Ghost, right now as a church um, to relinquish control. And I thank you that we give ourselves to that today. And we thank you, Father God, for the possibilities that that people might behave in ways that we don't appreciate or that we don't think or events and circumstances might happen, Father God, because we're relinquishing control. But that's okay, God, because we know you're in control. We know that we have access to all your provisions and you are fulfilling your word uh, your word in building the church and that the kingdom of heaven is on earth asserting its power at this time, in this hour, through our lives as we give ourselves to you. We are followers of Jesus because we have relinquished control. We bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a fantastic week um, and, and I pray the Holy Spirit continues to minister to us through the week, stitching us up carry what he's speaking to us about in relinquishing control. Bless you guys.